They say once you put something on the internet, not only does it stay there forever, but it also becomes fair game for criticism, an open invitation for people to give their opinion on it. But what if what you share is just your own personal experience? That opens up a whole other can of worms. That opens up the bits of your life you share to judgment which I feel could be worse than criticism by itself. I want to start off by saying that I'm not good at storytelling. At least, I don't think I am. But I will try my best to convey the events in this story as clear as I can make them. But I apologize in advance if this video sucks in the end. This was actually intended to be my very first storytime video, but events at the beginning of the year changed that. So I guess this would be the third one? I don't know. While my last storytime video was a story of royal pettiness, this one will take many turns. Several of them will actually be dark ones, so you've been warned, and I just hope I don't scare you off. How do you share a story so personal behind the very thing that people come to see you for? Garage kit painting became my passion, something people can easily see in my videos every time I upload the process of a new project. But what if that passion started with EMOTIONAL DAMAGE! Before I go any further, I want to warn you that if you're very sensitive to topics of personal tragedy and emotional trauma, I would highly suggest you stop watching and just go check out another video that is not as serious in topic as this one. I have plenty of those in my channel to keep you entertained if that's the reason for you being here. For many years, people have asked me the same question. How did you get into the hobby? Trying to answer that question always made me very uncomfortable. Not because of the question, but because the answer always made me remember painful memories. I wish I could say something normal like, oh, I saw a friend paint a figure and I tried it myself. Or, I like collecting anime figures and discovered GKs in a collector forum I used to visit. But no, my story is one of love, deception, and betrayal. If you're a regular subscriber, you know my format. I usually bring out a kit and I show you how I paint it along with an explanation of my process while you see me work on the screen. This one though will be a little bit different. Today, I'll be repainting my very first garage kit. A tribute to my love for a particular series. A series that holds an enormous place in my heart. I want to share my very personal story with you. And while I'm at it, rip off this emotional band-aid to finish the healing process. So come join me in this catharsis while we paint a pretty damn old eternal Sailor Moon figure. For me to tell you the story of my Garage Kid beginnings, I'd have to tell you about the time when the guy I loved destroyed my life. Dramatic, I know. One more story in a millions to add of other women who lived through exactly the same thing as me. We all think our stories are unique and special, but they really aren't in the grand scheme of things. But they are to us, and I hope that those of you that are living or lived through something similar can find some solace in this video. It was the year 1998. Yes, I am dating myself, and in case you Gen Z people come a knocking, yes, I know I'm an elder millennial, no need to point it out. Just sit down and listen to what this old biddy has to say. Like many girls in their preteens, I would dream of having my first kiss and fall in love. You might have guessed by now that I'm a fan of this little show called Sailor Moon. I remembered being enamored with the series because it encapsulated my feelings at the time. Pure and innocent feelings of wanting to fall in love with my very own tuxedo mask. I started collecting things from the show. My mom one day brought me a little comic book from the magazine booths from downtown. I loved them. It was just a comic book version of the actual anime episode, just in printed panels. So I started to get all the new issues each month. It was my secret that nobody outside my family knew I had. Because back then, being an anime fan meant that you would be the laughing stock of your peers. I was a little embarrassed to say that I still watch cartoons, and I also wanted to avoid being bullied further. A story for another time. <laughs> But silly me, because well into my 30s, I'm still a huge anime nerd, but now it seems it's cool. Who freaking knew? I certainly never saw that coming. At the time, I had a school friend, 
I'll call him Dick. Dick would call me out of the blue trying to make chit chat. He was two years my senior in junior high and I used to be best friends with his best friends. Yet him and I didn't really interact much. So his calls were strange for me, but then again, I was glad to have someone to talk to, even if it was just for mundane things. One day after coming back from my new Sailor Moon comic book issue, he called. Hey, what's up? What are you up to? Oh, not much. Just got a new comic book. Really? Which one? Mm, Sailor Moon? Sailor Moon? You like Sailor Moon? Hey, um, I gotta go. Uh, wait, no, don't hang up. I actually like the show. Really? I didn't believe him. I had been bullied for all my short life and I could feel when someone wanted to do that to me at that point. I quizzed him. And sure enough, he knew everything and even a bit more than what I knew. And back then, there was no internet to Google stuff on the spot, so I knew he was in line when he answered all my questions. That was a catalyst for him calling me almost daily just to talk about the show. He then became my confidant and my best friend. I would share what my father used to do to me. He was very emotionally, psychologically, and physically abusive, not only to me, but to my sisters and my mother. And Dick was the only one I could really talk to. Two years later, and he would still call almost every other day. But we would never really see each other. It was just talking over the phone for hours on end. He would usually start the conversation with something Sailor Moon related, and then we would change subjects during the call. But she was always the starting point in all our conversations. Until one day, he asked me out for lunch, like uh, to actually see each other for the first time in years. 16 year old me never thought of anything of it. Of course not. It was just two best friends seeing each other in person after a very long time. I mean, it's not like we lived in the same town. Yes, we did live in the same fucking town. This was pathetic and laughable. The day came and we met in person for the first time in years and it was weird and it was awkward. Hi, so uh, you want to get some to eat? Uh, yeah, sure. That's what we're here for, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. We were both visibly awkward with each other and just sitting there in silence for a while. It feels so strange not to be talking over the phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is kind of strange. Man, I wish we had like a curtain to separate us on the table and a phone so we can talk like what we normally do. <laughs> so, how about that Sailor Moon comic? We just ate after that interaction, awkwardly, and then he drove me back home. If it weren't for his horrible taste in music, the ride would have been pleasant, but nope. It was awkward silence on my part. When we got out of the car, he was fiddling with his keys, and then he went back into the car and he gave me an envelope. Read this when you're completely alone in your room. Close the door. Don't let anybody in. Uh, okay. Why? He immediately went back into the car and this time he brought out a freaking Bible. Do you believe in God? Mm, not really. Kinda? I don't know. Swear on this that you will do everything that's instructed inside. Um... I don't know about that. Swear or I'll take it and leave. At that point, curiosity got the best of me. All right. I swear I will do everything you're asking as long as it's not something illegal. And with that, he went back into the car and ran out like a fart out of hell. I was perplexed and honestly pretty clueless. Why did he have to leave in a hurry? What the hell was inside to warrant such reaction? What, what, what just happened? I opened that envelope later that night. Inside, there were three smaller numbered envelopes, a cassette tape, and a bottle of alcohol with some matches. And as I opened envelope number one, I was shocked to read that he was professing his love. He confessed that he had been in love with me for the past three years, since we were still in school together. This was a very creative letter to say the least, I'll give him that. With a mixtape included and even instructions to burn the letter if I didn't accept his feelings, 
With the matches and the alcohol, he included to burn any evidence. I couldn't believe it. I honestly never saw him as something more than a friend. I was torn and confused. I didn't really love this guy. Sure, he was easy to talk to on the phone, but it felt really awkward in person. A few weeks passed and I had been thinking of his confession all that time, wondering if I should accept his feelings, thinking that maybe it could be a bad idea. <laughs> Foreshadowing! Because we had been friends for three years at that point, and if it didn't work out, then I would lose someone special. In the end, I decided to do it and called him to ask him to come to dinner at my house. He reluctantly agreed, and he didn't sound that excited when I called him. So he came over after I invited him for lunch at my house. My mom left before he arrived. She was kind of excited for me. Uh, she even made us dinner and all. We ate. It was awkward. It was weird and it was silent. You could hear a pin drop and cut the tension with a knife. So I read your letter. Is, is that so? And he didn't turn red, no, no, no. He turned vermilion red. Why are you mentioning it now? You never called back when I asked in the letter. So that means you don't accept my feelings. So I don't even know why I'm here right now. Obviously a person that can handle rejection quite well. I know your letter said to never talk to you again if I didn't accept to be your girlfriend. It took me a while to think about it, but I asked you to come here today because I wanted to give you the answer in person. I would like to be your girlfriend. I just remember him pulling up his shirt up to his face to hide it at that point. Are you sure you won't regret it? Little did I know those words would haunt me to this day. Because I did regret it. It's one of the few things I regret in my life. But 16 year old me said, no. Nope. I wish I could go back in time and slap teenage Leona a million times over. June 16th of the year 2000, we started dating. Even though I was not in love with him, I still wanted to give it a try. I had been waiting for this to happen. I mean, I had been fantasizing of finding my very own tuxedo mask after all. He didn't look anything like him. In fact, he wasn't even my type. And now that I think about it, I honestly don't know what the fuck I was thinking back then. Dude was probably a four compared to tuxedo mask. But looking back on it, he would give me so many love letters, all Sailor Moon themed saying things like how in love he was with me and how he was so lucky and how I aged like fine wine. The more time we passed together, the better I got. So I guess pretty words made me feel pretty things. Spending time with him and letting him woo me did the trick. After four months together, we were hanging out outside my house and hugging at the hip as teenagers do. And he said it. I love you. Now I need you to understand that while saying that in English means one thing, saying the big I love you in Spanish is a big thing. We have two ways of saying that we have feelings for someone. One is more serious than the other. And man, I gotta tell you, Cupid's arrows do hurt like a motherfucker and you go gaga for a few moments before you can say anything back. So after my days, the words came out of my mouth on their own. I was now in love with him and I fell hard. Remember that I mentioned that my dad was an abusive asshole? Well, my parents divorced a little bit before this and I really never had a relationship with my father. And in retrospect, I would hate to say this, but Freud had something going here and not all his theories were bullshit. It kind of has some truth to it. I was feeling loved, secure, protected. It was a drug, an addiction I craved, and I wanted more. As time passed, I became obsessed with being with him. I would lie to my mom. Sorry, mom. So I could be with him in secret. My mom started to dislike the guy, and I don't blame her. I think she saw something there that I never did at the moment and even hated him at the end. We had arguments. She would question everything I say, not believing me, even when I was being sincere and telling the truth. Other than just sneaking around to see my boyfriend, my grades never fell. I still kept them high. 
I was just really not failing academically, which is what she was worried about. But she just didn't want me to hang around with him so much because, uh, you know, parents think of when they see their children dating and right around the time when the hormones are on full swing. Basically, her head started spinning. She never really ever talked about the birds and the bees. My mother was raised Catholic and you know what that means in regards to sexual education. She's a product of her time and I knew it, so I had to learn on my own through other means. So even if I was going to mess around, I wasn't gonna do it recklessly. My mother made sure to traumatize me in years prior, telling me that if I ever got pregnant, that my life would be over and I would end up like a cousin of mine that ended up with a kid at 19 and her whole life went down the drain. So thanks, mom. That lesson worked so well that I ended up being a child-free adult. I was getting tired of having to sneak around to see my obsession. And when I'd meet him, I rant about how I was arguing with my mom over seeing him. It's as if I felt like I was in one of those forbidden love movies. Like, remember Romeo and Juliet with Leonardo DiCaprio? Yeah, I felt I was living in that world. And he would just hug me and be close to me when I was just expressing my frustrations to him. There was a particular day where I had an argument with my mom and I left to see him, to have him comfort me, as he would usually do. We were standing there, hugging, one dark afternoon in January, and then he said, I wish I could take you away from this place, so we could be together. There it was, the seed he planted in my mind that would later change the course of my life forever. Our first year anniversary came around and we met in secret. We couldn't really go anywhere public out of fear of someone that knew my mom would see me. So we just basically met and stayed inside the car in some parking lot. Then suddenly my mother called on my cell phone and demanded I come home ASAP because something had happened to my sister. I panicked and I got back only to see my two sisters perfectly fine in the dining room. My mother sitting on the table with the most seething expression I had ever seen on her and on the table next to her hand, my secret diary that I had never shown anyone. All I remember then was two slaps across my face and being filled with an uncontrollable rage knowing that my mother searched my room to find it. I wrote many things in my diaries, things that I felt, what I thought, what I did, and that included the many things that I would do with my boyfriend. So you would guess that anybody reading something like that would probably lose their mind. A secret diary is supposed to be that, a fucking secret. She demanded to be taken to my boyfriend's house to speak to his parents because what I had done was apparently so unforgivable that the only way she thought of punishing me was to make me end things with dick. I refused, but my older sister grabbed me and took me in her car by force to his house against my will and my mom brought along my diary. I had never felt more trapped in my life and I was even thinking of opening the door and sprinting on one of the red lights, but they put the damn child lock on. I honestly don't know how my sister knew where my boyfriend lived, but she knew. When we got there, I felt my stomach drop. What the hell was my mother planning on doing? She just looked back at me and told me to stay in the car and that she will be speaking to Dick's parents to put an end to this. But before stepping out of the car, she said that if this boy would not agree to marry me, that she would call the police and press rape charges against him. I was only thinking, what the fuck are you talking about? I'm 17. Why would you want to force me to get married right now? All because you were thinking or sleeping around? My mother was not thinking straight. Her emotions were in control. She was brought up in a very traditional way. And for her, this was the right thing to do because young girls shouldn't mingle with men if they were not married. This, of course, was ludicrous for me. I wanted to scream at her, calling her crazy, but I was too livid to say anything. The only thing coming out of my face were tears of anger and a knot in my throat. My fight or flight reaction was canceled due to the fact that I was locked in the car. And as she stepped out with my diary in hand, 
I just started angrily crying more while my sister had the most blank expression that made me hate her for what she did. Because funny thing, my sister had lived by herself since she was 18. She's 10 years my senior, and she was free to mess around with whomever she wanted. Why the fuck was she supporting my mother in this? What moral authority did she have to act like she knew better? Now I need to step in here and say that we never really got to do the deed. We were just making out like teenagers do, but my mother never believed that. She went in and maybe an hour later, she got back into the car. She just told my sister to drive and she then said, you will never see this boy again. His parents will get in legal trouble if you do meet. Because the only ammunition she had against them was our ages. He was 19 and I was still legally a minor. So she thought that she could have a say in this. Needless to say, I was embarrassed, enraged, I felt violated and humiliated. Who knows what my mother told my boyfriend's parents? What did she show them from my diary? What did his parents think? I just wanted to disappear thinking all of that. I was under house arrest. My mom took away my keys and locked the gate to keep me in. I was basically trapped and desperate to see Dick to know what was said at his house. My world back then was shattered. I was numb. Eventually, I found a way to get out of the house through a window and left because I just wanted to get out after being locked in for several days. While walking through the streets, I wondered what I could do. I remember an intersection and seeing the green light turn red, and I just thought, what if I just keep walking right now? Yes, the thought of ending it all crossed my mind for a millisecond, but something pulled me back. Like in an anime when your favorite character is beaten down and almost lost the will to live. There's a moment where they have this dead stare in their eyes and then all of a sudden the life comes back to them and they start to fight back. That's what I felt happened to me at that very moment. I wiped away my tears that had been running down my face for days at that point as I walked and thought, why end the life if I can start a new one? The next day I called my boyfriend <laughs> secretly with a cell phone I had hid and didn't use out of fear of being caught with it. In a moment where I thought nobody was home, I locked my door and called Dick. The thought of just hearing his voice made my heart jump out of my chest. I wanted to hear it so badly and so... Hello? Hello? I miss your voice. I thought your mother took your phone. No, I hid it before she took away my keys. Are you alright? If she did anything to you, I swear. No, she locked me in the house and he's not letting me leave, but I'm fucking tired of this. I can't live like this. What do you plan to do? I want to leave for good. How? You're locked in. My sister's birthday's in three days. People are coming. I think my sister's friends are staying over. The gate will have to be open the next day. Are you sure you want to do this? Yeah, I don't want to stay here another minute. I just, I can't take it. It's torture. Do you have anywhere to go? No. Maybe I could call a friend to see if she has any room. I really haven't thought of where I would go. Coming here is definitely not possible because my parents would get in trouble if your mother brings the police over and charges them for kidnapping. I know. I have a friend. He owes me a huge favor. He lives with his girlfriend and has an extra room at his place. I'll ask if he can take you in. A few minutes pass and he calls back. My friend said it's okay. He can offer you his place while we figure this out. All right. I'll start packing. I love you. See you soon. And at the age of 17, I left. I took whatever clothes I could carry in the few garbage bags I was able to grab, my small Sailor Moon collection, my boombox, and a few other small things. Now, my mother overheard the conversation. Don't ask me how. I do not know to this day unless she was standing in front of my bedroom door 24-7. And she asked me if I was truly leaving. Because if I was, then she would be the one to open the gate for me. I think she realized she couldn't really control me and we were living in a very toxic and hostile environment, being with each other. We weren't talking, I wasn't even eating, 
I spent all my time in my bedroom and if we did cross, I just looked at her with rage. We couldn't talk in a civilized way. There was no family therapy back then, so there was no way of fixing our relationship at that point in time. And we couldn't continue like that. We were on fight mode 24-7. I needed to leave and she needed to let me go. And so she did. She opened the gate and watched me take my things, one trash bag at a time. I never looked at her in the face that day. I was way too angry. I left the only home I knew. I didn't have a job, I didn't have any money, and I didn't have a place to fall dead on. I ended up staying at his friend's house, which became a much bigger problem at the time after I moved in. But that's a story for another time. This was somewhere my mother didn't know about. Because of her legal threat against his family, they couldn't really ask me to stay with them, but they did tell me that they would help if I needed it. So that placed me in a very difficult position. I needed to find a job, I had to go to school and graduate to prove my mother wrong because I heard through the grapevine that she was telling everyone she knew that I was going to come back crying, that I was never going to graduate high school, and that I was going to end up pregnant. I had to stay alive and prove my family wrong just out of spite. I was thrown into adulthood way earlier than anticipated, but I didn't care. My anger was greater than my fear. I did find a job in a few days, so I was now going to school and working so that I could save up to rent my own place. It wasn't easy. I had to change schedules so that I could work during the day and study at night. I was exhausted most of the time in the week and I didn't help that I ended up as an employee at a small amusement park where kids run around rampant and scream all the time, which was something I hated greatly. But it was the only place that took me in while I was still a minor and didn't require a signature from my parents to work. School was draining and I felt alone because when I switched schedules, I lost the only few friends I had in class and I ended up being placed in the new group where I didn't know anybody. But it was all so I could graduate and make them eat their words. But while I had these hardships in front of me, in my mind, I felt liberated and now free to see my boyfriend whenever I wanted. Or so I thought. Going to school and having to work almost full time was overwhelming for me. I thought that by leaving my home, that I would get to see my boyfriend whenever I wanted, but now I would see him less. The times we did get to see each other, he would always have some sort of family event at his place or going to another family party somewhere else. Basically, a grown ass 20 year old man still attached to mom and dad instead of wanting to be with his girlfriend. So we didn't get a lot of alone time. I was getting fed up with this because here I was. I sacrificed everything to be with him and he didn't seem like he wanted to make an effort to be with me. At least not alone. Not in the way that I thought someone would do when, you know, you sacrifice everything for them. When I was still living with my mom, he would constantly say things like, oh, I want to buy a house and I want to grow old with you implying that he wanted to marry me, even going to the point where one day he even gave me a ring, but since it didn't fit, he took it and never gave me a new one because he said that he was going to have it resized, but I never saw it again. I was basically expecting him to also take responsibility for the situation, to always be together, to live together, to love each other forever. I wanted him to respond to me the way Tuxedo Mask responded to Sailor Moon, but oh no, I was so wrong. As time passed, the situation wasn't changing. We would argue over him not leaving his family to spend more time with me. I was the one working and barely scraping by with everything and he was still living with his parents rent free at 22 enjoying himself going to concerts, UFO exhibitions, and having fun. His mom was still cleaning his room and making him food for fuck's sakes. Basically living worry-free, while I was working at a call center in order to pay for my basic necessities without actually affording any luxuries. Living paycheck to paycheck, and he never once offered to work so we could move in together and help me with expenses. 
you know, to kickstart that dream he had of us being together? The whole reason for me basically leaving my family? I did attempt to mend things with my mom after I turned 18. I practically hid from her for six months so that she wouldn't try and call the authorities to force me back to go with her. So I called her on my birthday. I tried to have a nice conversation with her, but I could hear it in her voice. She was very hurt. Sometime later, I even went back and visit her in person. She would be happy to see me, but she still had a very sad expression on her face. She would ask me if I could come back, but by that time, I had tasted freedom and I didn't want to go back to living under her roof and her rules. So I always declined and when I did, she would constantly say, It's Dick, isn't it? It's because of him that you don't want to come back. While there was a truth to that, I just simply liked living by myself. Not having to call anybody to ask permission to go anywhere and basically do whatever I wanted. I was never a party girl. Going to clubs, drinking and smoking were never my thing. I just liked doing nerdy things like going to Comic Con, Anime Expo and do geeky stuff like that. I had to threaten her and say that if she kept accusing Dick of me not coming back, I would no longer visit her. She didn't know where I lived. So this was the only way I could establish boundaries. She agreed to never mention it again, and she never did after that. But I could tell she just wanted me to come back, and me not doing that affected her a lot. I did get to graduate from high school. Not exactly top of the class, but still up there. I didn't get pregnant, and I never went back crying. I proved all my family wrong and invited them all to my graduation ceremony and party to low-key rub it in their faces for their lack of faith in me. Everybody was happy for me. But my mom, I think she wanted to feel happy for me, but she was still too sad. I look at the pictures from back then and see the pain in her expression, and it's something that haunts me to this day, and it breaks me to know how much I hurt her. But through this time, my silver lining at this point was just enjoying being able to see my boyfriend whenever I could. And for the next two years after I ran away, our relationship was still somewhat magical. At least, it was to me. Being madly in love with someone is like a drug. You're constantly being pumped with endorphins just by looking at that person. So my uncertain living situation at times were set aside in my head. They were nothing when I was with Dick. I felt like I could go against the world and win as long as he was with me. We did do a lot of things. We went to Anime Expo, like I said, and Comic-Con and other smaller conventions. We were even starting to plan a trip to Japan because honestly, we were both obsessed with anime and we needed to go to the land of the rising sun and see everything. But our relationship started to change. With each passing year, it would go from amazing to great to rocky due to him not cutting his umbilical cord with mommy and daddy and his lack of commitment. But I was still very much in love with him. So in love that when red flags started to pop up, to me, they were just flags because I was seeing everything through pink colored glasses. He got hired at a cable company and finally got his first job. Sometimes he had long hours and I would get to see him maybe a few times a week. With him now working, now we had less opportunities to see each other. One day on our third anniversary, I was at his house and he was getting out of the shower for us to leave and celebrate. I remember he sat down on the bed with his towel around him, still wet, I was looking at some magazines while I waited for him, and then he just stood there with a serious expression. Maybe we should stop seeing each other for a while. I began to cry with shock and disbelief. I panicked. For a split second, I felt the same way the day that my mother slapped me across the face. My world was shattering, and as I continued to cry, I asked... But why? We, we were getting ready to have dinner. I thought we were doing great. Why is this all of a sudden? Okay, now. Forget what I said. We're okay. Let me get dressed. Then he hugged me and said everything was okay, but I was still asking myself, why? What made him say that? He made me feel horrible for a moment. Oh, for what? He didn't explain himself or even apologize, so no, it was not okay. For the next three and a half years, he started to lie about work. 
saying things like he had to stay late or he was sent somewhere and he wouldn't be able to see me for some time. At that moment, I had basically isolated myself from everyone, my family and even the few friends I had, so that I had all the time in the world to see Dick at a moment's notice if he had a day off. The obsession had gotten worse the less time I spent with him. One day when I knew he had the day off, I asked him if we could go out to eat because it's been so long since we've done it and he agreed. But when I got into his car, I smelled a woman's perfume on the co-pilot's seat belt. Definitely not one I used, so I didn't recognize the smell. Uh, who's been in a car with you? Nobody. Why? Because I smell perfume on a seatbelt, it is not mine. It's been months since I've been in your car. Oh, I think it was a co-worker. I see. But why are you using your car for that? Don't you drive the company car for work-related things? It wasn't available and I have to take someone somewhere. It didn't make any sense to me, but I believed him. Then I found makeup that wasn't mine on the co-pilot door. Same response. At that time, I began to be suspicious, but I felt really guilty at the same time for even thinking that he would be capable of something like cheating. So I pushed it aside in my head. Then one day when we were in his room, while cleaning, he was picking something from above his bed and a pack of condoms fell. We stopped using condoms when I got on the pill. Yet he had condoms on him? As soon as I could say anything, he grabbed them so quickly and just started laughing. <laughs> I was showing my little cousin how to use them. Kids, you know. Isn't he like 12? Yeah, but you know how kids are. He automatically made a justification for him having them. But he knew. He knew that as soon as I saw them, he had to say something to cover his ass. So once again, I brushed it off. But deep down inside, I knew he was lying. I was just in denial myself. We had hit the six year mark and we were still fighting over him not wanting to spend time with me and basically just not wanting to move in together. And why would he? His mother still made him daily meals, cleaned his room, washed his clothes and basically was still living like a goddamn teenager at home but with money to spend on his lovely Simpsons collectible figures. One day I called and asked if I could come over. He said no because he wanted to get some sleep as he had just arrived from a 14 hour shift and was hella tired. So I said okay. I hung up, but something told me to get in my car and drive to his house. I don't know what got into me. I just grabbed my keys, still in pajamas, and drove. I parked across the street where I had a clear view of his entrance and just stayed in the car, questioning what the hell I was doing. And not 10 minutes later, I saw him from my window, all dressed up for a night on the town, in pouring rain, getting into his dad's car at 11 at night? Why? Why was he all dressed up and leaving when he said he was just going to go to sleep? My mind began to race. Where was he going? Why wasn't he taking me? Heck, why did he lie to my face? I didn't know what to think or feel. Here I was. I caught him lying. Now, how would I confront him? If I said anything, he would have known that I was at his place and he would have something to say against me. I went back home crying and angry, thinking of what I could do to catch him red-handed with definite proof of deception. He was taking advantage of the fact that I was so fucking loyal to him that I 100% always believed in his word and trusted him. So instead of calling his cell, I started calling him at work asking for him and when he wasn't there I would start to question him about it the next few nights as he had previously told me that he would be working but he just evaded my questions and said he was busy. I was getting extremely frustrated and angry. I wanted to communicate with him, talk things over, but I felt like the person that I knew before was no longer there. Things didn't change and for the following six months after that he stopped talking to me entirely. He avoided me. And if I somehow managed to convince him to come to my place, he would just fall asleep on my bed at the moment that he arrived, as if to say, look, I'm here, aren't I? But at the same time, he wasn't really there, if you know what I mean. I asked him so many times what was wrong. I was even apologizing for things that I thought I did, but he kept silent. It was like talking to a wall, especially every time I asked if there was another girl. 
I'm not proud to admit this, but I started to act very toxic myself. I didn't know what else to do to get him to open up. I even side baited him because I was desperate. Desperate for an answer to a simple question. Why? I became extremely depressed through this ordeal of me trying to get anything out of him. My days were miserable, all day long thinking to myself, what did I do wrong? How can I get him back? How can we go back to where we were before? I kind of stopped dressing well and personal care was very low. All this situation began to affect me in many ways, not just emotionally, but it was showing on the outside. It all came to a head on October 26, 2006. My cell phone rings in the evening. It was him. Finally, after maybe a month of not knowing where he was or what he was doing, I saw his name on the caller ID. I was finally going to hear him through, I thought. But all I heard was a cold voice on the other end. Hey, can you meet me at Café Flower in an hour? Uh, yes, I I'll see you there. I got up, I tried to dress in something clean, and rushed to meet him. My stomach was churning, my thoughts were all over the place. There I was trying to contact him for weeks with no avail, and now this? I had hoped he had come to his senses and finally realized the damage he'd done to me. I was even willing to forgive him there and then as long as we could go back as to what we used to be. I stepped into the cafe. He was sitting in the table that we usually sit in. He had the hardest stone gaze on him. I sat down. I wanted to kiss him hello, but he avoided it. Why did you want to come here to talk and not go to my apartment? With the most frosty expression I had ever seen on him, he just said, We need to break up. I was speechless. He never told me why. I just froze. I couldn't believe what I was hearing, but I had the feeling that he was going to do this to me. My eyes started to water. I was just looking at the table, and then he said, But I still want to be friends with you. Friends? You want to be friends? After all he had put me through for the last six months, he still wanted to be friends? I couldn't look at him in the face. I couldn't make a scene. I couldn't cry and attract attention. I was a mess in pajamas covered by a thick jacket, and all I said was, I wish you the best and ran to the car with tears filling my eyes. I could barely see where I was going. It was a rainy night like that time I caught him lying for the first time. It was pouring. I didn't know where to go or what to do. I only remember turning the engine on and then being in front of my mom's house. I don't remember what happened between leaving the cafe and getting there. I guess my mind went into autopilot and I just went to the only place I knew there was someone I could turn to. But I was terrified when I realized where I was. I thought she was going to say, I told you so, being that I had left home because of him and caused a huge rift between my mom and me. But no, she was there. And as soon as she saw me walk through those same gates that I walked through six years prior, she was there with arms wide open for me. Literally. She saw me drenched and crying, and she immediately hugged me. Even after so many years of having a strained relationship because I left, she was there for me in my lowest point in life. She tried to console me by saying that maybe it was just a bump in the relationship and that he might just be confused and he will call back and we can get together. But I knew it wasn't. I cried myself to sleep in my mother's arms. The next day I woke up and continued to cry for another two weeks, sleeping in my mom's living room because my old room was converted into a sewing room. And I couldn't go back to my apartment since he had used one of my spare rooms as storage for his shit. So just looking at anything of his would cause me so much pain that I couldn't bear be near my own house. I lost the will to keep going, questioning why this man would do this to me. The man that said so many times how he loved me, how he wanted to be with me and grow old together. He had done a 180, five years full of sacrifice for him. For what? For nothing in the end. After the breakup, he rejected my calls, sending them to voicemail. I tried to call him through payphones for him to answer, and as soon as he heard my voice, he would hung up. I was sending him text, asking him what I did wrong, but nothing. Radio silent. I couldn't think straight. 
I even quit my job because I couldn't think of anything else except why. I didn't even shower for weeks. I fell more into depression, in denial of what happened, thinking it was all a dream. A friend showed me an online MMO game and installed it in my PC. I started to play almost 24-7 trying to distract myself from my reality. The game and the people I played with there were the only thing keeping me from feeling immense pain. Quitting my job caused me to be unemployed for six months and getting behind on my rent. I went through my savings, which was all the money that I had set aside to go on this trip to Japan because that was one of the things that we were planning on doing. And I started saving a couple of years back, but I had to survive at this point. I didn't end up homeless, but I did owe a lot of rent and I had no food. If it wasn't for the very few friends that I had, I wouldn't have been able to get non-perishable foods and survive another month. They all got together and took me to buy food by force because I didn't want to ask for help. I had way too much pride to ask for anything. They pretty much dragged me to the supermarket and made me fill up the cart and I would never forgive their kindness. In the middle of my crisis, a package arrived. I had entirely forgotten about placing a special order during those last months where I wasn't having any luck contacting or talking to Dick. I was desperately trying to think of ways to save my relationship. Late one night, I got into eBay and started looking for special and unique Sailor Moon items I could probably buy. All gifts for him to make him remember why we got together in the first place, which was our mutual love for the series. I found and purchased a Sailor Moon limited poster, a replica of Usagi's engagement ring, and an eternal Sailor Moon figure. Absurd, I know, but I was desperate. I didn't know what else to do. I had ordered the figure three months earlier before all this happened, so when I got it, I didn't even remember what it was or that I had even ordered it. When I opened it, there it was the eternal Sailor Moon figure that I had ordered months ago in an effort to try and save my relationship. I thought it was going to be painted, but to my utter shock and surprise, it came in fact unassembled and unpainted. I scoffed and I just didn't want to deal with it for a refund. There was no point in doing anything to it. What was supposed to be a special gift became a painful memory and it felt like someone was pouring salt into a very fresh open wound. So I put everything back in the box and threw it under my TV stand. It hurt so much to look at it with the ring and the poster that came along with it at the same time. Three months after the breakup, my mom would worry about my emotional state constantly and tell me to try and get a hobby. To distract myself because all I could think of was him. My depression continued. I was alone and recused myself in my apartment. Until a co-worker friend of mine from my call center days came over unexpectedly. Someone I rarely saw after I quit that job. You know him. You've heard him. And you've seen him in my videos. It's just one of those times when someone comes to you when you most need it. When the universe sends a message, you better pay attention. What he saw was a shadow of my former self. Lying in that couch, playing on the computer, still in pajamas with messy hair, and just dead inside. When I told him what happened, he was majorly pissed. Not at me, but at my ex for being an asshole and not coming to pick up his shit and making me suffer for that long. I will forever be grateful to him for picking up the pieces of myself and helping me put me back together again and rise from that depressive state. He introduced me to his friends, they became my friends, and from then on, I was part of their circle, at least for a while. When you go through a breakup, you pass through the five stages of grief. You look for answers to questions, go into denial, you bargain, and you get angry to finally accept it and move on. After my friend introduced me to his friend group, I was hanging out with them a lot and I was feeling a little better. I had passed through the first stages of a breakup, desperate for answers. I was in denial. I had tried to bargain with my feelings, but I had yet to experience anger. That came when my older sister told me that she had seen my ex with a girl. A girl she described in detail. A girl I knew 
very well. She was an ex-co-worker of mine. My sister told me that she had seen them together way before our breakup several times, being very close to each other. You're asking yourselves how? Well, my sister lived in the same area as this girl, but I guess my ex didn't know. I didn't want to believe her. I was going back into the river of the Nile. And a few days later, I decided to ask a mutual friend if he knew something. After begging him to please tell me if he knew anything, he reluctantly agreed to tell me and confirmed it. All those lies, all those times I smelled that perfume, the time I saw the makeup, those condoms, it all made sense. This motherfucker had been cheating on me for at least a year. My rage was greater than the time when I left my home years prior. I felt so betrayed and so stupid for believing in him all this time. He took advantage of my loyalty for him and full trust. It felt like a knife was stabbing me in the back laced with acid. You could be surprised at yourself when the feelings of pure love for someone could change to pure hatred in the span of a second. For many months after that, I was so angry. The feelings I had felt for him transformed from being madly in love to wishing him death. Because he destroyed my life. He disregarded everything I sacrificed for him. He used me. All he just wanted was the benefits of having a girlfriend, but not the commitment that comes with having one. As my friends would come and visit me more often, I would get distracted myself and I'd get to leave the house. I started to acknowledge and start to try and get over my anger. I was beginning to accept what he did. I wasn't okay with it, but I was no longer in denial. I was home one day and I started to do some deep cleaning in my apartment because it had been a mess since then. I started to rearrange my furniture, throw away trash, I cleaned almost everything except my spare room, where all my ex's shit was still there. He had a lot of plastic bins and boxes that he had just left there. Lots of the items were his collectibles and others were, were just crap that he had nowhere to store in his house. I didn't want to go in, at least not alone. So I called my friend and asked for help. He knew exactly what had happened to me and what this asshole did. So he came over right away and started to help me by taking out all his shit from the room and out into the hallway of my building and out of my sight. I even took the opportunity to pack the shit he gave me like stuffed animals and other items into boxes. And in my fit of rage, I took all the photos from when we were together and ripped them all and threw them into those bins. Since my now ex was not answering my calls, my friend took it upon himself and called him from his cell phone. Hey, um, you don't know me, but I'm calling on behalf of your ex. Oh, I don't want to speak to her. Yeah, no, you don't. She doesn't really want to talk to you either. I just called to tell you that if you don't come and pick up your stuff you have in this place in about two hours, everything is going to the dumpster because she really needs this room. Oh, also, please leave your keys with the neighbor. Okay. Well, it doesn't seem like I have much of a choice then. Yeah, okay, I mean, just thought you wanted to know. When he hung up, I asked him what he said, and he just said that Dick sounded pretty pissed, but said that he was on his way to pick up his things. Okay, grab your coat. We're leaving right now. I don't want you here when he comes over. My heart started to race again, knowing that he would come close to my house, but I made sure to leave an extra lock on my door that he didn't have a key for just before I left. It wasn't even two hours later that my neighbor called in a panic asking me what happened because my boyfriend was there throwing things down the stairs. I told her what happened and to please ask him to leave my key with her. I could hear all the noises he was making from her phone. It sounded like he was just throwing all the boxes down four flights of stairs and apparently he was also alone. She said okay and an hour later she called again to say that he was gone and he'd left my key, but she said that she had never seen him that angry before and asked if I was okay. 
I said, yes, I'm okay. I'm with company and to not worry. And as I hung up, I felt a huge relief. My house was mine again and his presence had been erased from my now safe space. Around the holidays, I was watching TV at my place and I noticed the box I had put away a while back. I had completely forgotten about it. I opened it and took out each piece one by one. I looked at it for a moment, remembered him, but since I never got to give him the figure, it wasn't really tainted with a particular memory of him, so I thought, why not? I had some acrylic paints that I had used to paint some plaques a few years ago and took out my brushes and just started painting that figure. When I was younger, I used to paint a lot of ceramic pieces, so I figured that it wouldn't be much different from painting what I used to paint. <laughs> foreshadowing again. I was of course thinking of Dick and all that had happened. What I felt was pretty raw. I couldn't really see anything related to Sailor Moon during those months because it all reminded me of him. So it hurt to see her. I sold a lot of my Sailor Moon collection, like my original complete pocket mix manga, which I honestly and wholeheartedly regret to this day. It was one of my most precious possessions back then. A lot of collectibles that I have gotten at Comic-Con when we used to go together, and other things that I painfully regret letting go. All because my sentimental memory to the series was now attached to his image. But I kept that figure, and I'm glad I did. It was therapeutic, it was painful, but it was pleasant at the same time. I had forgotten the amount of joy doing any type of crafting gave me because I stopped doing it when I started going out with him so many years ago. So it revived a sense of creativity I had lost sight of. When I started to paint that kit, it's as if it took away all the pain with each brush stroke I did. And when I finished, even if I did a horrible job, I stood in front of my creation and felt a sense of satisfaction. Looking into her eyes, those eyes that I painted, made me realize that I didn't have to be hurt anymore when seeing Sailor Moon. I had made peace with her and managed to separate her from that of the person that hurt me so much. And there and then, a tiny seed was planted in that broken heart of mine. Back then, the internet was still evolving. At only a few years old and 112 KB speed, I got interested in these figures. This was the time where there were very little pre-painted figures of my favorite anime, so I would look for information about them. There were very few sites that would have any useful information, but it was still something new to me. I started to buy more resin figures. I wanted to know how to paint them. Then I found a now extinct modeling community that shall not be named. And that board gave me life. Every day and almost at every hour, a new thread was being posted with more and more information. Pictures of these amazing figures would appear, painted by other members, many figures of series that I never knew existed. Heck, I was freaking smitten. It sparked a passion that burns hotter than the fires of Mount Doom. It became my precious. This hobby saved me from that depressive jail. It showed me a whole new world I didn't knew existed. I started to reach out to so many people that had the same passion and the love for this hobby. And I even made new friends all over the world and some who I still talk to this day and met in person. So if there's anything I could say about my ex, I'd say it's because of him that I found my passion for garage kits. I've made a lot of dear friends and I was able to see past my tragedy and look to the future with hopeful eyes. My identity back then was just me being a girlfriend and nothing more. I had dedicated my time and even life to someone and completely forgot about myself as an individual with wants and needs. In my desperation to hold on to someone, I discovered something that made me hold on to me. It's funny how one man can have the ability to destroy you, but then the universe decides to send you another one to make it right. Several years after my breakup, I had been working at a new place. My overdue rent had been paid off, I was painting more figures, and basically rediscovering myself. Don't get me wrong, I was still pretty messed up in other ways. 
but at least I had finally gotten over the asshole that has left the mark on my life. Then Destiny brought me to meet my current partner. We met on a local online anime forum thanks to me posting about my figures. We got together and while that happened, I was still working a regular job at a production plant as a receptionist. Then returned to being a call center representative. Those are other stories that I would love to share with you guys if you're interested, but long story short, I was miserable. And while we were splitting everything 50-50, even when he was still earning more than me, I insisted on that share because I was a proud independent woman. And they didn't need no help from no man to, to go b about my, my new life. One day, as I finished my shift with a migraine and almost in tears from frustration of having to deal with the abuse from idiots over the phone, he saw me and asked, what do you want to do? You're always so miserable doing this job. If you could do something else, what would you do? I looked at him and said, I don't know. I had tried to go to uni twice, but left halfway because I was just not vibing the programs. I honestly didn't know what I was doing. I had never thought of what I wanted as a career, so I never put much thought into it. Just go to school, have a degree in something, but I didn't find anything that interests me. So I only had call center jobs where the only thing I had of value was my dominance of the English language that paid just a bit more than the other jobs available for somebody without a degree in higher education. I just turned to the table that I used to have where I worked on my kids and said, I would be happy if I could paint figures all day. And he said, then do it. I earn enough for the both of us. Do it, but do it right. Quit that job that makes you miserable. I was speechless. I couldn't bring myself to accept such an offer because for the past 12 years, I had been an independent woman, TM, and didn't need no help from nobody especially not of a man. It took some convincing on his part because I was too stubborn to accept it. But eventually I decided to take up his offer. So the next week I quit that horrible call center job. I updated my website and opened commission slots for those that wanted painting services and started to upload a few videos here and there on my channel. At first I felt like panicking because the memory of being unemployed and going through almost homelessness was still very fresh in my memory. I was about to go into fight or flight mode again, but my boyfriend was there and he helped me this time. I was no longer alone and I could now focus on doing what I enjoyed while having the support of someone so that I can kickstart my career in art, something I never thought of before and discovered that this is what I really wanted to do ever since I was a child. And that was just to be creative. It was because of him that I'm here now. His insistence to do what made me happy brought me to you in this moment in time. And the rest, as they say, is history. It's been 17 years since this happened. I've changed since then. I started going to therapy. I mended my relationship with my family. I asked my mother for forgiveness and she as well asked for mine. We have an amazing relationship now and I have fallen in love again. This time with an amazing man that supports my art and what I do and I think I'm in a much better place than where I was when all this came crashing down. Sharing this story was somewhat cathartic for me. Aside from my therapist and my younger sister, nobody knew much of what happened to me back then. Not even my current partner. So. Thank you for letting me share part of my history, for listening and letting a little bit of my life become public because for many years I was very ashamed of it. Ashamed of what I did, of what I made my mom and my family go through, but mainly ashamed of what I put myself through all that time blinded by an illusion. It also took a long time for me to forgive myself for all the shit I did because of him. Be kind to yourselves. Know that while things might look dark in one moment, there's always light at the end of the tunnel and you won't ever see it if you don't give yourself the chance to advance and reach it. Moral of the story. Dick is abundant and of low value. Don't fall for the first one you get the chance to, especially at such a young age.
All I can say at this point is that forgiving yourself for things that you've done in the past is one of the hardest things you can do. But when you do, the freedom you feel is euphoric. I don't know if you like this new format. I'm not even sure if my storytelling was any good, but you'll be the judge of that. I've never shared a lot of personal things, something here and there, but if you're interested in more than just my work, which I honestly wouldn't know why, then please let me know in the comment section of this video. I'm genuinely nervous and want to know if this type of content would be well received in my channel moving forward. I also don't know if this video will get the yellow dreaded dollar sign, so uh, the super thanks button is just down below if you want to support my channel. I have so many stories that I would love to share, some less traumatic and way more entertaining than this one, but personal stories nonetheless. I was forced to grow up and mature when I was very young because of this and probably have several lifetimes of experiences compared to others my age at this point. So hit the like button and let me know if you would like to see more of these videos or if I should just stick with my regular format. I've been following another art channel called Emily Artful for many years now and her story time videos were the inspiration for me to bring out my own. All the credit for this type of format goes to her. Writing this was chaotic. There were times when I broke down crying because unlocking these memories made me feel pain as if I was reliving it. Reading it out loud was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. But now these memories will stop haunting me. I know he still stalks my socials and fan accounts because I received a notification a few years ago that he started following my Instagram, which I immediately blocked. That was a catalyst for me to start writing this script. I honestly don't know why he can't just disappear after so many years. So if you're watching this, and I'm sure you will at one point, if it wasn't because of what you did to me, I would have never discovered the very thing that brings me joy and passion. And I would have never met my current partner that pushed me to be where I am today. I am freeing myself from the shackles of your memory and it will no longer hurt me.